But we don't want to do just that. We're going to want to do some elemental speciation. Some of you have seen this picture before. And we're going to use primarily size exclusion through this because we don't need to do any more. We're going to typically monitor zinc versus time. And size exclusion will give us four or five peaks at high molecular weight and at low molecular weight. And it depends on the column. Some columns have 100 kilodalton, 100,000 dalton. A dalton is one m over z unit. Some columns have that as 100. We use that. And some have 10 kilodalton, and some have 600. The one we used most was the one with 600. And then our folks over there, I don't mean to make light of it, because this is a lot of talent and work to do this stuff. The protein expression via real-time PCR, the knockout mice experiments, and the ones with the silencing RNA to prohibit certain proteins of being formed. At this point, we note that depleting the zinc from the HC markedly reduces its growth. Adding zinc back enhances its growth. No question. That is, we add T-pen, but then we add more zinc, and back it comes. We ask, how do we maintain sufficient zinc levels in the macrophage, yet starve the other one? And some of the reviewers argue us with us, is this starvation really immunization? It's like asking me, how many angels dance on the tip of my pen? because I wouldn't have a clue, and it doesn't matter, but some people get very fussy. So, uh, nevertheless, the zinc starvation uh, is important. We need to generate a model, we think, because there are lots of experiments we can do and try to explain certain things, and that's what I'm about to do now. That model, in the end, is going to look sort of like that. The one I show you isn't quite like that. But I'm going to go piece by piece. I'm going to clear out the cell, except for a few things that are my favorites, like the nucleus, and a couple other things. And then we're going to do some experiments that tell us, OK, you can add a little more information here. So first, with and without the cytokine, that's a question asked. Do you really need this thing? Is it necessary? Uh, this are the peaks that we're going to look at. What we're seeing here in these two chromatograms are zinc 2 plus bound by metallothionines. We see this hundreds of times. It's not like repeating an experiment three times. We see this hundreds of times, and we find that this little star here is going to mean activated. If you don't see a star, then this macrophage basically is worthless. So, if you look here at the non-activated macrophage but has disease, you see considerably less of the zinc metallothionine than you do here. Of course, we had to do mass spectroscopy to determine what those were. But I'm not going to show you those. I'm just going to ask you to believe that around 20 here in the size exclusion, and you'll see these peaks go up and down as a function of what we do, and what we do helps us build our model. OK? Any questions? And feel free to ask questions as you go along. Or as you go along, who wants to give this talk for me? OK, so there's that experiment. Could cytokines other than GMCSF uh, reduce or change the SCICBMS profile? We can add that other cytokine, and you see in the area 20 minutes, nothing. Doesn't matter if it's infected or not infected, it just doesn't matter. So that particular cytokine doesn't activate. It is very useful in the animal system, but it does not happen to activate these cells we were using. Ah, there's my stripped down model, and of course, 
The cell is much more complicated than that, but you can't see everything or you don't see anything. Uh, we've got the macrophage. This is the cytoplasm. This is the cell wall. That's a nucleus. It has its own wall. And we're going to start to do some things. We know we're going to need the GMCSF cytokine to activate things. So let's just disease this cell. So we're bringing this disease into the cell. Actually, when it goes into the cell, the cell keeps it, puts it in jail, sort of, keeps it in a compartment. That has a cell wall. Lysosome is tied in this, and sometimes it's called phagolysosome. Lys means to cut, which means what this should do is cut these things all up, and then we'd, the disease would be gone. But it does not quite work that way. Uh, we also know that from the slides I showed you that we need that macrophage activator, which is the cytokine, and that will come to a receptor on the cell wall. So I don't get more complicated than that because I don't know more complicated than that. Let's see what else might happen. This cytokine activates these which activate phosphorylation. Well, let's think about phosphorylation. It is, some people would argue, the most important post-translational modification. That means after the protein is formed that you can modify it with a phosphate group. That's a simple way of thinking it. So if we modify this with a phosphate group, it becomes a signaling molecule. Well, what's its signal? Well, we're going to try to see what it signals in the next few slides. STAT3 signaling drives metallothionines to bind, bind zinc, so it must be signaling the formation of metallothionines. That's what that sentence means. It says, we know that these things are necessary to signal this thing to phosphorylate uh, a, a protein as well as the generate the metallothionines. Well, let's look at some of the statistical or some of our experimental evidence. Here's our activated bone marrow macrophage with five times in number. This is simple. One macrophage, five cells of the fungus. So here we go with this. Now we've got the bone marrow macrophage, but without the disease, and it doesn't respond nearly as much. That disease is a trigger to start doing this. And as you can see, there's our 20. That means metallothionines. They're building up. If we inhibit this phosphorylation, you can see there is no difference. So obviously, we have to have this guy there as well. And I showed that on the last slide. Well, we come to where we were last time a couple of slides back, and we try to see what else is happening. We showed that before. Nucleus, transcriptional activation protein expression, that we can determine by the uh, real-time PCR experiments, and we do that in George's lab and the medical campus. Let's see what else we have happening. Since these Two, phosphorylate and signal protein expression for which protein? Well, I've kind of already given that away, haven't I? In terms of saying, oh, I think it's the metallothionine. Uh, and we'll see, but it's not only the metallothionine. It, we can't just use up all the zinc in a cell, you know, by tying it up with a metallothionine. We've got to replete it or replenish it, and we may be doing that as well. So let's take a look at this. The expression, that is the possibility of having zinc import proteins are called ZIPs, and zinc export proteins are called ZINTs. Import is the cytoplasm and export is from cytoplasm, the cell fluid. So let's take a look at this. Ah, we see 14 ZIPs but only one is really nicely expressed, and that's ZIP2, to transport uh, zinc into the cytoplasm. 
That could be from other parts of the cell or it could be from the outside. These proteins sit on membranes. So they're like uh, the fire brigade. You pass a bucket to this one and goes there, there, back and forth, whatnot. But essentially, this one becomes important. And uh, the seven here and the seven here under different conditions, just the activated uh, cell and the activated cell plus the disease. And you show there's a remarkable difference in these. So something in there says, hey, we got invaders here. Let's, uh, let's muster the forces here. And well, you just notice the difference. Here's the zip two, in this case, activated bone marrow, but it doesn't care if it's activated. It's not gonna produce any of these zip proteins. You activate it, infect it, well, you could see the difference just as easily as I. Same with these, the difference isn't quite as much. So let's move on here. These are the most important, as I've stated. Using size exclusion ICPMS to determine zinc at different molecular weight ranges, well, you see zinc occurs at different ranges. But then again, there it is at 20. We determined this was a zinc metallothionine by molecular mass spectroscopy, but I said I wouldn't talk much about that, and I won't because once it's done, it's done. Here's the bone marrow uh, ma macrophage infected, uh, activated, et cetera. I'll look at the nice big peak there. Now remember, under each size exclusion peak, there are a lot of things. That's not the best chromatography to resolve things into individual species. All this can tell you is that in this molecular weight range, there's proteins and zinc. So if we want to identify everything in this range, we've got to take this fraction. Once, 10, 100 times, it just means how much you have to pre-concentrate it before you can do the molecular MS. Why? Those in the course may remember that we indicated that molecular MS is less sensitive than ICPMS. So what we see here may not be enough, so we may collect these fraction multiple times. Way at the low end here is when we find the free zinc. And look at that. Where there's more zinc metallothionine, there's less free zinc. Now, it isn't much. And I don't think there's hardly any free zinc or any free anything in a cell. Uh, but then I'm not one of those who knows but I can guess. This gives us our range of this fraction, and this gives us the range of this, and we're identified just as I said. No, oh, we're back to the cell. Okay, let's see then what we, what we know from the last two. We might be able to see, we saw the zinc, or the zip two was really expressed. So we can say, well, we can sit these down on the various membranes, this membrane, that membrane, this membrane. If I sit them here, they're going to grab zinc from the outside and bring it into the cytoplasm. If I sit them here, they're going to grab zinc and bring it into the cytoplasm. If I sit it here, and I have nothing to do with sitting it. Nature controls everything, not Job. Uh, but if I sit it here, I can imagine, hey, from this compartment, I'm going to steal the zinc. Yet, I should be able to maintain it inside the macrophage to sustain it. So, let's go on and see if I have another something come up. Yes, now I'm showing it taking zinc from the inside. And I'm showing it expressing, uh, uh, not only expressing, but forming another protein It'll call metallothionine one and two, the two isoforms, very common protein, lots of sulfur, and will bind with zinc and other metals. Uh, so far, we're studying mainly the effect of zinc, and it is, uh, we've done experiments that show it's the most important. So now we got these zincs in here. The cell is uh, kind of like, a, people think of this stuff running around in there. Well, that, it's hard to imagine. A cell is like a, a syrup or almost a gelatin inside when we say cytoplasm. So it is unlikely you have lots of this free stuff there. 
and metallothionines can circulate it, but they bind it. What good is it if they just slip them around here and there? Uh, well, as it turns out, the seventh site of the metallothionine is not so, does not so tightly bind the metal. And so it can release it, and we're going to have to figure out, well, how it's going to do that and where. What happens to zinc metallothionines if we don't have any of this stuff? So we do experiments over and over to try to prove in a whole variety of ways. That's the biological sign. Here's our ICPMS with size exclusion. Here's our peak at 20. Our metallothionines show up. Here's the, and this is activated with the disease, activated without the disease. We don't produce much metallothionine. Uh, and uh, activated without, you're going to see you don't produce much zinc. Another way of looking at this green panel or this pink panel is to look at them as a bar chart. Pink, much more of the free uh, uh, zinc uh, than in the case where we've added the infection to the activated white blood cell.